This is Sheldon Ferris, uh, Indigenous Rights Radio Coordinator for Cultural Survival. I'm from the Khoisan Peoples of South Africa. It is day four at the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. We are in the Indigenous Media Zone, and today I'm honored to have uh, two gentlemen uh, showed up at the IMZ and uh, really interested in, in what we're doing as cultural survival, but we were more interested in what they were doing at the uh, IMZ. I've got uh, Norris Brenham, who's a filmmaker and his historian uh, with me, and then I've got uh, Kevin Inglesby, who's a PhD student at the University of uh, Montana. Let's get introductions from both of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, let's start with you, Kevin. <clears throat> So just a general introduction? Yeah. Yes, so I am Kevin Inglesby. I am over at the University of Montana studying cultural anthropology with a sub-focus of sociolinguistics and linguistics. I work with my advisor who is uh, Dr. Neachet Graymorning, uh, who is a, a linguist working uh, in the fields of indigenous language revitalization, and he has coined a, a method of accelerated second language acquisition that I work with and talk about just the general communication around how to address these topics within academia, outside academia, and uh, the political implications that found all of these processes. And that's pretty much what I'm working on so far. Queen Ganao, Nin de Shinzi, Yela Takwa, Ninon Jiai, Lena Peoking, Ok Shiekbi, Nawalotamen Wanduk, Takwa. Anishik, Kishalamokoin, Anishik, 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 Anishik. Uh, greetings. My name is Norris War Turtle. I am an Afro Indigenous member of the Sand Hill Band of Lenape and Cherokee uh, from New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. And um, that was a traditional greeting in the Muncie language. And, uh, you know, we're here to expound on what it is we would like to accomplish uh, creating our relationships with uh, people from across the globe here at the UN, so. It's good to meet you both. I'm so happy that uh, we have youth visiting such um, very serious meetings, conferences, you know, so it's really good to see that the youth are here. Um, so let's talk about language revitalization. It's still the international decade of indigenous languages and um, in our conversation, just off camera, um, both of you pointed to language revitalization as an area of interest. So um, the languages in your communities, um, Norris, is Yunami and Mansi. Can we talk about the state of um, you know folks speaking the languages and writing the languages and, and how active it is with you know, English being so dominant, Espanol being so dominant everywhere? Do you find that, that folks are actively engaged in learning, teaching, writing, reading uh, these languages called Yunami and Mansi? I'm currently here in the state of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. There has a, a, been a serious revitalization of the, of the languages. In our Muncie communities, uh, in the Ramapo uh, communities, they, uh, they have language classes. Many people can speak the language, you know, not as fluent as they would like to, but we can greet each other, hold basic conversations, you know, enough to facilitate continuing to, uh, you know, learn more from the language. But it's a, it's a heavy revitalization. We also, um, Princeton University has been holding a uh, history and language symposium. I think it's about three, four years in now. We've attended multiple um, symposiums, and these are attended by Lenape from all communities. Uh, the Delaware and Oklahoma, Wisconsin, uh, Canada, uh, you know, just all the different communities that are out there, the, the Delaware Nation, you know, there's different communities of the Delaware. Mm -hmm. um, the Canada, the Canada Muncie, um, they, uh, they have spent time, they have come down to New Jersey and shared a lot with the tribes in New Jersey um, in terms of the Muncie language, and uh, that's the primary language spoken in New Jersey at this point. The Unami, they're, uh, that language is a part of the revitalization that's going on in with Princeton and also Rutgers. So there's a lot going on in the state in terms of uh, academically as well within the tribal communities. 
So that's really good to hear. I'm excited to hear that. Um, so besides the two of you, um, you know, your peers, uh, do, you, do you find that youth are doing much um, to, to actively be involved in the revitalization of, of languages? Maybe uh, you give it. So yes, I think there's a lot of pockets of younger individuals who are very vigilant towards yeah, reclaiming languages and participating in processes to advance linguistic initiatives in a plethora of very creative ways. So the method that I largely work with, with my advisor, it, um, it's pushed forward through a phonetic or just a, a sound-based system that is, it promotes naturalistic types of conversation, which draws a lot of people because uh, you know grammar and the writing kind of shy people away sometimes from the linguistic revitalization stuff. But learning how to speak it from just the sound and being told is opening the doors for a lot more people who are younger to want to be engaged with these environments and, and creates creative and fun ways to do it, such as engaging with like pictures, uh, having a room that is a serious topic, but being able to go through in a, in a way that is upholding you know cultural attributes and isn't just some really uh, strict procedure of this is how you learn a language. It's a, a naturalistic type of thing where it comes through more of a conversational type of style. And that was one, one thing that I've seen so far mm -hmm. that draws a lot of younger people in, as well as the interface and integration with technologies and stuff. So we're also seeing the creation of apps, uh, things like keyboards, and uh, other algorithmic platforms that work with languages. And that is another big thing as well that, uh, yeah, draws in the younger crowds because they can start to interface with things like the creation of stories and like Adobe storyboards and create their own characters to have language flow through as a learning tool and mechanism, which provides a good artistic outlet as well. So, so you, what got you interested in it? Um, was this what you study, right? Your PhD student in linguistics? Uh, political anthropology and linguistics. Okay, so what got you started? So a large driving force of what got me started was actually from law and legal precedents around what can happen with language or even in certain areas at certain times who's allowed to speak languages in different areas. Because we've seen in uh, Hawaii, for example, where people were be being arrested for speaking their native languages. So learning about the legal precedents behind policies and statutes that uh, in influence culture and political proceedings fascinated me with, when it comes to language. So I started to ask the questions, well, and along with a lot of other people, how do we change that? How do we shift these types of legal precedents to facilitate open yeah, dialogue around language? Mm -hmm. And uh, also, you know, reclaiming the robust cultural values that are, you know, embodied in language. Mm -hmm. So seeing all of these things paired with, yeah, that side of political proceedings and actual cultural expression to, to truly express one's culture, uh, you know, language is a key facet to, for that. You know, not to say that you can't without the language, but it, it grasps a lot of what is embodied within a culture. So seeing all of these attributes really sparked my, um, my driving force, my impetus to want to be an ally to facilitate the reclamation and just re revitalization of languages. So how do, we, how do we take it to the youth? Um, and I want to hear about your filmmaking um, efforts. Uh, does it have to, anything to do with, uh, with language or taking culture to the youth? Because we need to... It's, it's difficult to put things in books. It's hard to read because we are distracted. Uh, everywhere you go, you see a billboard or the radio is on or the internet is right in front of you. Television is on 24-7. So we have all of these electronic devices that, that are very, very distracting. Um, do we take do we use technology to meet this need? Because it's a dire need. Um, we've been colonized. English is here. It's not going anywhere. Espanol is here. It's not going anywhere. It's growing and growing and growing. So uh, what do we do in terms of media in general, film, radio, TV, um, to, to take our fight forward in, in terms of revitalization of languages and cultures, really, Norris? Um, I think that is very important. I, actually, I believe in meeting the youth where they're at, right, and then bringing them up, raising them up, as opposed to you know, coming in, scolding, and this and that. So what we do with our media and what we've strived to do over the years, I started a company called Turtle Gang Edutainment in 2008 and I chose the name to appeal to the youth you know because they were being s absorbed into a type of culture in the Americas that is very gang oriented um, I wanted to appeal to that in a way where in the sense of I don't know if you're familiar with our gang the little rascals right so these were a bunch of kids who were kind of left out 
and they all came together. So I wanted to create something in that vein that was a platform for the youth, for people who are trying to find their way back to their true narrative. And so that's what my company was about, and I wanted to walk the line between the edginess of what the youth are appeal, you know, is appealing to the youth, as well as bringing cultural and historical aspects to the table. So what we do is we create short films, short uh, narratives that give them a glimpse into historical things, but we give it to them in a, in a setting that is digestible for them. So we utilize uh, hip hop, we utilize, you know, uh, short stories, you know, we want to do some horror films, all these things that appeal to the general people, but then we want to, uh, you know, give them some jewels within it. So we have a, um, we have a, a artist, uh, his name is Medicine, uh, you know, he makes rap music, but what we do is we incorporate much of our language into our choruses, into things like that. So when the kids listen to the music, we can give them terms from the language, right, that they can easily pick up because it's embedded in the song. It's, it's got a rhythm to it. Mm -hmm. So we do things like that. You know, like I said, we just, we want to concentrate on meeting the kids where they're at. And sometimes it can get a little, you know, because of where the kids are, but you know, that's, that's the goal we take. You know, we want to be able to confront them with artwork, with art, things that are appealing to them yeah. and slide the information, you know, coded within the art. So that's our main uh, objective is to use the art to grab the kids. I'm gonna let you think about um, how we're gonna close off the session. Uh, you need to tell us, give us some of those lyrics or something at the end. Uh, we, okay. Oh, that'll be really cool for us to hear. So um, let's bring it back to Kevin. So with uh, technology comes um, new challenges. And some of these challenges include um, just exposing what is inherently ours. Um, so we, we talk about apps, for instance, and teaching kids uh, some of our languages that are dying out on, on an app. Mm -hmm. But once that is there, that information which, is, which belongs to us, yeah. which is our identity, I can go as far as saying language is identity, but now it's, it's out there, it's in, the, it's in the ether, basically. So how do we protect intellect, our intellectual um, property once it's, it's, it's out there? Because it's something that's so, it's like our DNA, it's like our blood, our language is us, you know? And so it, it needs to be protected, it needs to remain ours as owners. Thank you for that. So when you start to talk about the legal side and the paradigms that house personhood, time, and space, we want to talk about really injecting law into how we talk about, you know, the creation of apps, the creation of keyboards, the creation of platforms uh, um, that have digital aspects that involve any type of information. And when we get into the world of intellectual property, that is a way to safeguard these types of things, but inherently that calls for a certain way to approach it. So um, one large concept that I work with is a chronotope, which is time, personhood, time, and space. And when you inter intersect law within these uh, constructs, you have a platform to create an informationally robust and culturally reflective uh, pattern for an algorithm to function on, whether that's constructing an app or a keyboard or you know, just a website. But all of that data, the property that is uh, around these types of things is held by the person who knows the legal status and standing to articulate to a company when they're trying to make a deal, or even with people who are gonna be purchasing and using an app, or even for terms and conditions for a free, a free type of app. So I think it's really important to safeguard how conversations around the entire topic flow and the forums that they're brought to. Because people create things on their own, they create things on certain platforms, like, uh, like Google or, or Adobe, but who has, uh, they, they, one would have to look into who owns and retains the property rights to the things that are created. Mm -hmm. So one thing that is starting to come out now, and I'm sure it's been working, people have been working for a while on it as well, are just decentralized platforms to create their own uh, robust systems of safeguard by the, and cultural safeguards. So the community is housing the data and the community is working with things to be able to promote and push out to a larger public while not being exploited from that and while not losing any uh, 
property rights to said thing, both socially but also legally as well. And that's why I bring in the, the idea of talking about it and making this more of a public conversation to know that while an app that is free can be used by a lot of people, but a certain level of respect must be upheld when using it and when using and interfacing with certain databases. So the social side is just as important as the legal side to uphold these types of protections that can be instantiated in a, in a certain legal precedent status. That's wonderful. It's a lot to, to think about. And we're grateful that uh, you are at the helm, PhD student, doing really well just representing the youth and you know taking care of what our ancestors has entrusted us with. Language. Language is everything. OK, so um, I think that is where we leave it. Uh, Norris is going to leave us with a little something. Just so, so, do you want me to play a little bit of it? Because it's not my song, but you would like to, you like to hear no, it. No, just a few, just a few words, maybe. Just a few of the words. Just a few of the words. So we have. Uh... So we just um, just shot a movie called Mountain Lion, which takes place in the Lenape Hoking territory, Lenape territory. Um, one of the songs which is featured in the film is a song called Shiekbe. Shiekbe is the name of the territory that would be New Jersey. So the, uh, you know, I'm not, I can't sing, but the lyrics are more like, she me my home, she me the place where my ancestors roam, she act me, she act me. And it's just a way of introducing the actual indigenous name of New Jersey to our listeners. Easily digestible. So now, once this song is, movie is out, the song is out, people are going to know, oh, New Jersey is called she me. Just like we know Manhattan, we'll know she me. So that's just an example of uh, some of the things we're trying to do with the music with our films and things of that nature. Be my home, shake be my throne, shake be the place. Come on, my dude. Ancestors roam, shake Spill the beans, serve them up. Sheldon Ferris, Indigenous Rights Radio producer for Cultural Survival. This is day four at the U uh, United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues.